Hey, hi, welcome. <laughs> I'm Mark. Uh, I'm a research software engineer at CSTMS. Um, and today, I'd like to talk about some of the key software technologies that go into building the cyber infrastructure for CSTMS. Now, before I begin, I want to thank the organizers of this conference. This is awesome. Thanks, Boris, for introducing me. I also want to thank the uh, colleagues of mine at CSTMS. So, Eric and Albert and Lynn and Rena and Greg. All right. So, what is CSTMS? So, the Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. Uh, it's an international organization. Uh, and in the past 10 or so years, it's grown to be over 1,700 members, which is great. Uh, so, CSTMS was founded uh, for the purpose of supporting the science and in particular, the modeling of Earth surface processes. So uh, on that foundation, three pillars have arisen, three pillars of CSDMS. So community, computing, and education. And I'm gonna to focus today on the computing pillar. And by the way, CSDMS is a, a, a fierce advocate of open source, so open source software, open licensing, open development. So thank you, Greg, for letting me see your slide. All right. So when CSDMS was in its design phase, uh, Jai Savitsky and others decided on a bottom-up, community-driven approach to modeling this, this organization that they were bringing together. All right. So the idea was, step one, that researchers, in the community would write models for surface processes. And these models would be written in whatever language they felt most comfortable with. All right, so that's great. So you can see in my diagram that there are models that are little, models that are big, models are written in Fortran, models written in C, maybe in Python, etc. All right, so the next step, and this is the tricky one. So a modeling framework would be developed that would allow these models to communicate with each other and exchange information. This is the concept of coupling that you're all familiar with. But please indulge me for a second. You know, the idea could be maybe a more concrete example is that you could have a river model and a landscape evolution model. And perhaps the landscape evolution model would have an uplift event that would change the course of the river, but the river would erode the uplifted landscape and transport sediment downstream. And you could couple that with a delta model, for example, et cetera. You can see how this works. All right, so that's the second step. And then the third step then is hopefully with this novel approach, we could advance science, the science of Earth surface process model. All right, well, so that second step, those question marks, that's kind of the key. Oops. So, this eventually became the CSDMS modeling framework. And so what I like to talk about in this talk is a, a story, a story of how we got from question mark, question mark, question mark to the CSDMS modeling framework. And I'm gonna tell this story uh, by presenting problems that were in the way and then the software technologies that were used to overcome these problems. All right, so the first problem, how can we standardize access to models? Now, you can imagine, you know, looking at this diagram, that these models written in different languages, they probably have different calling syntaxes, different configuration files, different boundary conditions, it's a mess. All right, so if we can find way, a way to standardize the way that we call a model, it'll make it a lot easier, both on us as people, if we're trying to write code in order to couple models, also for machines, if we want to automate that process of model coupling. So we solve this through the basic model interface, or BMI. Let me grab my notes here. All right, so BMI provides a standard interface for a model. And let me step off first just a second and talk about the idea of an interface. So in computer science, this has, this has a set meaning. So you can imagine an interface is like a template, all right? So we have a 
bunch of functions. Each function has a name and it has defined inputs and outputs. However, the interior of the function is empty. Nothing there yet. When we implement a BMI, that's where we actually fill in the code inside that function. So the interface is kind of empty, but it has set rules for what the function names are, what the inputs and outputs are. So just to give a little more concrete example, uh, BMI has a function called get time units. That's a really easy one. All right, so I think get time units doesn't have any inputs, and the output is a string with whatever unit the model uses. So days, seconds, years, whatever. All right, so you can imagine that a model developer could just, you know, say return days, or maybe they query their model and ask for whatever units it's using. All right, so that's kind of the idea behind BMI. All right, so BMI has uh, functions for setting up and pairing down a model. These are initialized and finalized. You can see these a couple times in this talk. It has functions for advancing the state of a model through time, update and update control, for example. It also has functions for getting and setting variables from inside of a model, get value and set value, as well as other helper support functions like get time units. All right, so when a researcher writes a model, they can implement a BMI for it. You can think of the BMI as sitting on top of the model. The model doesn't care about the BMI. You can still run the model without the BMI. But by adding a BMI, this allows you to add your model to the CSDMS modeling framework. The first step was doing so. And maybe just to go a little further, why? Who cares? Why would you want to do that? Well, you know, if you have your model in the CSDMS modeling framework, you're part of the community, your model could be picked up by someone else, in the, someone you don't know even. They could use it for, you know, for a purpose that you had not imagined for your model. So it's kind of advantageous as a community member to add a BMI to your model. Okay. Um, and so just a couple last words. So BMI is a design pattern. For those of you who are familiar with this idea, it's basically a wrapper. Uh, and the neat thing about BMI is that once you've seen one, seen them all because again they can be used in the same function it could be initialized whether it's in Fortran C Python or whatever okay so I have a little uh, sketch that tries to show how BMI would work inside the CSCMS modeling framework so imagine I have a pair of models model A and model B uh, for simplicity for this example I'm going to assume they're written in the same language come back and check that later uh, so even though they're written in the same language, they could have you know, very different calling syntaxes, you know, different configurations. You see one's a procedural routine, the other's an object-oriented routine. So they, they won't necessarily make it easy to, to pass information from one to the other. If we add a BMI, you can see, oh, I'm gonna get this right here, hang on. I have words. Okay, so you can see that each model now has a standard interface. It's represented by the suggestively congruent puzzle pieces that I've used here, right? And so for simplicity for this example, let's also assume that the puzzle pieces, the BMIs, are written in the same language. Now, maybe they don't have to be in the same language as the model, actually. Like maybe, you know, models could be in Fortran and BMIs could be in C. That's actually not very hard to do. At least let's assume they're in the same language for right now. As you can imagine, you know, these models could actually be coupled through their BMIs. These puzzle pieces fit together with a very satisfying click. All right, so, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so this does work, actually. I, I've, I've done this before in my work. It's only for a narrow set of cases, though. So, it's, it, it, so in theory, we could exchange information between these two models just through their BMIs. But there's more here with more detail. So this gets to our next problem. So how can we ensure that the information that we exchange between couple models is the same? Right, the 
solution to this is CSDMS standard names. And let me try to motivate this a little better through an example. So let's say, for example, that I have a model, and it models something in the atmosphere, and one of the output variables is temperature. Great. Right, so that's surface temperature, that ribald temperature, or is it virtual temperature? Maybe it's potential temperature. Is it three meters? No, it's the surface. Maybe it's a 10 meters. Is it instantaneous? Is there some averaging happening? So you can see what I call temperature in my model, or maybe T or temp, may not be the same variable as what other people call temperature in their model. This is where CSDMS standard names comes in handy. Again, let me check my notes really quick here because I have some good words to use here. So CSDMS standard names uh, use a template for creating unambiguous and easily understood standard variable names according to a set of rules, a grammar, if you will. So the grammar of CSDMS standard names is we have an object. In this case, this is the atmosphere at the bottom. It has a quantity, temperature, that's what I'm using, and optionally, operations that could be performed on that quantity. This isn't quite my example, but I wanted to show the example of an operation. So this creates an unambiguous name for the variable that I want to use. Now, model developers don't need to use this inside their models. That would be awful. I could still use D capital T underscore DT to represent this variable in my model, but in the BMI that I write, I would use these to unambiguously communicate what variable I want to exchange. And then the idea is in the BMI, you'd have some dictionary mapping between your internal variables in your model and the variables that are exposed to the wider public through the BMI. All right, so that's the idea of CSDMS standard names. Oh, and Scott Peckham, like one of the architects of CSDMS, also has several papers standard names, where he goes into more detail in the theory. Okay, so we solved this next problem. So now we've standardized, we standardized interfaces for models, we've standardized the way we exchange information. The next problem is, how can we couple models written in different languages? So this is a pretty big one. You know, this goes back to my, one of my early slides, you know, where I had all those models in different shapes and sizes of different languages. So, so, so far we haven't addressed that. The way we would do this in the CSDMS modeling framework is through Babel. Um, I have an asterisk next to the name Babel because we currently use Babel in the CSDMS modeling framework. However, we're looking at moving away from it. And I'll explain a bit why a little bit later in the talk. So Babel, though, is a very cool piece of software. So it was developed uh, as a DOE project uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and a couple of other collaborators elsewhere. The idea is, is that with Babel, uh, it supports five languages. So C, C++, Fortran, so Fortran 77, 995, and 2003, uh, Java, and Python. So those five languages. The idea is if you give it code in one language, it will spit back out wrappers for all those other languages. So the neat thing, like in theory, I could give it Java code, give me back all these wrappers, and I could use a Fortran 77 wrapper around Java. It's kind of funny, like that. But it's possible with Babel. So we only use a fraction of the functionality of Babel. So we use the Python wrappers that it gives back for the CSDMS. Um, so we accept code written in those five languages. And we'll come back to that in a second as well. So we accept the code in those five languages and get back Python. All right, so uh, I have another little diagram showing how we would use Babel. All right, so imagine that we have models with BMIs. In this case, you can see model A and model B, they're in different languages because they're different colors. All right, further, a and B both have BMIs. Uh, the BMIs are in different languages as well. You can see they're in different colors. And I tried to make them different sizes so you couldn't fit 
these puzzle pieces together very well. Well, if we run them through Babel, they become Babelized components, right? And I love that word Babelized. We can use that word with pride. Uh, and so you can see that the orange, that would be our Python wrappers around these, they look like they fit together very nicely. Satisfying click to see that. All right, so again, you know, we could use uh, Babel to try to couple models written in different languages. So that's cool. And again, this works, but in a narrow set of cases, maybe a little wider than just VMIs, but still a narrow set of cases. All right, so what we need to think about next is how can we put all this together? So we've got VMI, we've got standard names, we've got Babel. How can we get all this together and also solve some other problems? So quickly, yeah. All right, so uh, some things to think about, even though I've you know, coupled A and B, you know, there are some kind of gnarly issues that are still left. Things like time interpolation. You know, what if model A had a time step of four Model B had a time step of five. How are we going to pass information between them and then be updated? Things like uh, grids. You know, maybe model A has a, a nice rectangular grid, but model B is an unstructured mesh. How are we going to handle that? Uh, things like units. Maybe you know, the time step in A is in days and in B is in decades or something, for example. Right? So there's still some knotty issues that we need to work on. These are included inside our solution, the Python modeling toolkit for PyMT. All right, so PyMT allows a user to access and interact with Babelized components uh, through Python. So this is really cool. I'm using Python now. It doesn't matter what the source language is. I'm using Python now. Um, so again, it handles details like time interpolation. I mentioned this, you know, through SciPy interpolate as well as some custom code. Is primarily written. Uh, grid mapping through ESMF, ESMF grid mapper. Um, units through UD units, which is uh, from Unidata at NCAR. Uh, and also output to NetCDF through XArray and NetCDF4. All right, so you can see in my little sketch, I have my Babelized components, but I've broken them apart again, and I've introduced yet another layer of middleware, which is kind of funny. We get all these layers in order to get these models wrapped correctly, right? But we can actually do this. We can run uh, Python and ac access these models. So on the right of side of the slide, I have some sample code for running a model in PyMT. And I'm kind of proud of myself that I didn't put any code in until now. This is talking about software, you know? I didn't want your eyes to glaze over, right? So even if you're not familiar with Python, kind of not, Hard to understand. You can see, oh, should I try this? Yeah, okay. You can kind of see that green dot. All right. So uh, you can see that I'm importing a model called Sedflux 3D from PyMT, actually from PyMT's set of components that it encapsulates. Uh, Sedflux 3D, by the way, is written in C. And so we're actually running a C model right now through Python. So you can see we create an instance of Sedflux 3D. It's called model. We then call setup on that model. Uh, setup is actually a method that belongs to PyMT, not to BMI. And what it does is it, uh, it provisions the configuration for a model. So Sedflux 3D, for example, has a bunch of configuration files and sample data files that it works with when you're set up through the setup method. So the last three statements, though, we can see those are just your BMI method. So initialize, which starts the model, it puts it at its basic state. And then in a for loop, we update the model 10 times in whatever its time step is. Finally, we finalize the model at the end. So this is exactly the code that someone would write. You can put yourself in the driver's seat. You know, if you had a model and you BMI'd it, this would be the kind of code that you would write inside of the CSCMS modeling framework to run your model. Now, coupling models requires a little more code that I can put easily on a slide. So uh, I actually have a demo that I can show. Uh, Chad gave me the, 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 the uh, not a good look when I asked him if I could do this here in my talk. 
So I'm not gonna do it here in my talk, but there's a break, I think, after our session. And so I'll set up in here or somewhere with my laptop, and anyone who wants to see an example, I have a couple of Jupyter notebooks, so we can actually run Pi and Pi interactively. Okay. So, uh, let me check my notes really quickly here. So, there's still lots of work to do. Um, and so, I have identified five of a zillion things that we could still do in CSDMS. So, let me first start with uh, Babel. So, as I mentioned earlier, Babel is what we currently use, but we're looking to move away from it. The reason why is, uh, Babel is a heavyweight piece of software. It does so much more than we actually need for our purposes. Um, it also is a little bit limiting in that it's kind of bound to Python 2, which is going away soon in favor of Python 3. Uh, it also doesn't support other languages that would be really helpful for us in CSDMS. Languages like R, and Julia, and NetLogo, for example. So uh, it would be nice to instead not use Babel anymore, but instead we're working on a, a homegrown solution instead. Uh, Babel also has relevance for the fourth bullet. Uh, so we want to decrease the time it takes from uh, having a model with a BMI and converting it into a component. So the way that the process works currently is a researcher in the community would write a model, they'd add a BMI to it, and then they'd pass it over to Eric and me here at CSDMS, and we would babelize it and make it into a component. And that's kind of a lengthy process. You know, we want to be able to democratize this idea of making a component and also speed up the process. We put the ixnay on Babel, then we'll have a faster way to do this. All right, so coupling with data. So there's no reason why a BMI couldn't work with a data file. If you can imagine a NetCDF file, I could call initialize and that would open a file. I could call uh, you know, get value and pull out a slice. I could call finalize and close the file. So we're looking at that as well. Also modeling in a geospatial context. You know, so right now there's an explosion of geospatial data and we need to be able to allow modelers in our community to access and use this data in their models in the CSDMS modeling framework. Finally, I think I've heard others say this as well, we need better documentation and examples. Frankly, we need better marketing. I mean, we have these cool things that have been developed and we haven't let our community know well enough how to use them and that they're there even. So we need to work on that. All right, uh, before I finish, just quickly links. If you download this presentation, you can click on the links and go to the different software technologies that I talked about in the talk. Basically, csdms.colorado.edu is a good starting point. All right, so in summary, CSDMS provides a cyber infrastructure that allows community members to uh, run and couple models. So hopefully this advances the process. Okay, that's it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I have a brief question. Can you give us an idea of how many kind of models are currently in use? That's a great question. So uh, uh, let me back up just a, a half a step. So CSDMS also has a model repository. Anyone can submit a model and basically give it the UI, the help page. So it's, it's a FAIR. So what is that? I can't remember the acronym FAIR, but it's findable, accessible, informative, things like that, all right? So a subset of those models are currently CSDMS components. So we have about, we had a big bunch. I'm gonna guess, I don't have an exact number, but like 30 or so. 30 or so of those are included in the CSDMS model repository. And it would be nice if we could reduce the friction between models in the repository, which we have like over 220 of, and the actual components. Questions? Thanks, Mark. It makes me proud to be part of CSDMS. Awesome. Um, so a lot of the talk in this meeting has been about coupling of surface process models with tectonic models. So is there any reason why a tectonic model couldn't be wrapped in the same exact way a surface process model is wrapped? Absolutely not. Great idea. Absolutely. 
Is there any reason why a surface process model, or sorry, is there any reason why a tectonic model couldn't be wrapped um, with a BMI and then babelized in the same way that a surface process model is? Yeah, there's no reason why it couldn't be. Um, I, I, I tried to make my talk as generic as possible, you know, model A, model B. I know there's a lot of details involved in making the models work in the first place, but I think that our framework flexible enough that it would certainly support it. I mean, the nice thing is, you know, we have Eric and Ruth working here, and we can help you, we can help make things work. Things are always fit into nice little boxes. Hi, Eric Middlestead, University of Idaho. Um, so in that vein, um, can your modeling toolkit, can the Babelized components handle parallel processing? That's a good question. So I think the direct answer is that no. So they aren't, the BMIs are not parallelized. The models themselves can be. We, we don't have any problem with that. Model A could be parallel, model B could be parallel, but we don't have a, a, a tight coupling between parallelized models. So um, if the model A is running in a parallel and model B is running parallel and they happen to be on the same processors, do would that mean you would need all the information to come back to Astronode before? Okay. Exactly, yes. That's a serious problem, and others have pointed out that that's a serious problem with CSVS and that's a serious problem. I can add to that. So, in my experience, yeah. this is an absolute big problem. So, that's why it's difficult to scale up to properly understand it. Fair, yeah. So A is currently what is the balance between surface process components versus other atmospheric information? And B, I assume that some of these components are not very different than the geodynamic model. So what can we learn from that in terms of how to better couple the geodynamics with the surface process components? Uh, for A, I'd say most of the models that are both in our repository and are surface process models. However, we also have wrapped models like ROMs, the regional ocean model. Um, I know that uh, Del Terris has wrapped Del 3D with a BMI. I know that uh, there is work on wrapping WARF at NCAR with a BMI as well. So most models are surface process models, but there are others as well. So for the second question for part B, I'm not sure I have a good answer right now, but maybe we could talk offline. I have an additional question that is, uh, how much overhead does this actually add if you add all this layers of code on top of it? How much does it actually slow down? The That's a great code? question. All right, so keeping in mind that, oh, I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. I'm gonna say coarsely. Keeping in mind that we don't care too much about performance, we're interested in coupling. We don't think about it a whole lot. However, it still works pretty well. I mean, it's actually not a very, although my, my wrappings are pretty thick on the side, it's a pretty thin wrapper around the underneath the code. So I can't tell you, for example, metrics. That would be a new thing to do, actually, to find out just how different they are, but my, Intuition is that it doesn't add much at all. Thanks, Mark. Is it on? Is it on? Yeah. This is Katie uh, Barnhart from the University of Colorado. So, a thing that's come up a lot is uh, the sort of potential um, and need for the parallelized surface process models. And as you just said, PyMT is not was not built with that intention, but my understanding is that you, know, you guys have worked quite hard to make these things very generic. What are, sort of what do you think the pathway towards making it parallelized would look like? Is that a you know, long, tortuous road, or is that something that you think is sort of feasible to do in CSDMS 4.0? That would be good. Thanks, Katie. Uh, you're not supposed to ask me hard questions, Katie. Come on. <laughs> yes, you do. You're good at that. 
Uh, so uh, I want to be careful. I think it's not trivial. And so you, the way you said this in CSTMS 4.0, that may be the way it works. Uh, uh, so let me be frank and say that I don't have a good answer to that. I think that Eric probably would have a better answer for that, at least better to, it'd be better to explain our position. So I think to, to try to be fair, it's hard the way things are architected now. And I don't have a good answer. Any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.